Hello and welcome to another 3ds Max tutorial in our Art Asset Pipeline series. This time, we're taking a close look at the concept of LODs along with the way they are supposed to be set up in 3ds Max and the way they function internally inside CryEngine. But before we get into the LOD setup itself, let's first have a short look at what LODs actually are for those of you who are new in the industry. The term LOD, short for level of detail, involves decreasing the complexity of a 3D model based on the distance it has from the player's perspective. Factors such as the importance of the asset, the size it has, the speed it's moving at, all influence the level of simplification that can occur on the object without making the transition noticeable. And that's the main factor that an artist would have to focus most on, avoiding any kind of popping. Popping is a term used in the industry to express the change in an asset's quality when the player is moving around the world. Similar to draw distance, a switch in LODs can cause the asset to distract the player due to our eyes being really good at perceiving movement and distortions. Therefore, there are a few sets of unwritten rules when creating LODs for your assets, such as the percentage of the overall vertex count that you can reduce from one LOD to another, the number of LODs needed for the best performance ratio, and the lowest you can go when it comes to the complexity of the highest LOD geometry. Wait. Highest? I, I, thought, I thought you said the lowest you can go. Exactly. LODs are usually counted backwards, starting with LOD0, which is usually referred to as the highest quality version of the asset, and in CryEngine's case, ending with LOD5, which refers to the lowest quality version of the asset. If we're talking about the hierarchy in which you need to set up your LODs, whether you prefer using 3ds Max, Maya, Blender, or any other 3D modeling software, the LOD0 version of your asset is always going to have the name of your asset, the way you want to see it in the asset browser. All the other LODs have to be defined and numbered accordingly. Let's have a look at the way we approach this in 3ds Max. This tutorial was made as a continuation to the previous tutorial in the series, so if you are new to CryEngine or 3ds Max, I recommend watching the proxy tutorial first, in order to properly understand some of the concepts we'll discuss. As you can see, I have a very simple boat here, which already has a proxy and three different LOD elements. Now, if you've seen the previous 3ds Max video in the series where we were talking about collision proxies, you might remember a couple of things about the dollar sign we normally use in order to flag a certain geometry type. That exact rule applies here as well. No matter if you use the CryTools pipeline or the FBX pipeline, using the dollar sign followed by the LOD number will ensure that the engine will automatically know which LOD is which. If you export your object with the FBX pipeline, using the $LOD method is not particularly necessary, since you can always pick which geometry element acts as which LOD in the FBX importer directly, but I strongly recommend that you always number your LODs according to this method, it will be much easier for you to discern between your LODs later on. The naming scheme for numbering LODs using the $ign technique is very simple. $ign followed by the LOD and its number and then you only need to add an underscore followed by the name of the original asset, or the parent, in our case, underscore boat. Now, if I shuffle through these geometry elements and I hide them one at a time, you can see that obviously the boat element, or in other words, our LOD0, contains the most detail and the highest polygon count. Our LOD1 is a little more simplified when it comes to the geometry, but all of the elements of the boat are still present. We don't want a sudden quality decrease between LODs, because we don't want to make it obvious to the player that anything has changed in the object. The so-called LOD ratios, or the distance at which an LOD switches from one LOD to another, depends on the system spec which you are using, so players who will play the game on ultra settings are far less likely to notice any popping, while those who play on low specs will see the object switching to the highest LOD much, much closer to them. Therefore, if you're using CryTools, we make sure to trigger a warning in the exporter if the triangle count of any LOD is more than 67% of the previous LOD. This is a warning you'll likely encounter, meaning that your asset can probably lose a little bit more quality between two LODs without making too much of a difference. We usually try to keep each LOD at around 50% of the polygon count of the previous LOD. Now with LOD2, we're simplifying the geometry even more, sometimes deleting some of the faces which we don't need, since it'll be pretty much impossible to see them at such a distance. And with LOD3, we begin to strip the asset of some minor details, which will not be really noticeable a few dozen meters away, such as these petal holders, some metal parts, and so on. Now you're probably wondering, how do we approach creating these LODs? What are a few things we should know when creating them in general? Well, making LODs means nothing more than just simplifying the model the best way you can, without making it all too noticeable. We're not going to get into modeling today, but you can find plenty of tutorials that can offer tips and tricks about modeling LODs for your assets. But as an example, even though this asset is already pretty much game ready at this point, let's create an extra LOD4 as an example. 
One tool that it can use to speed you through the process would be the same modifier I used in the last episode in the series as well. It's the Pro Optimizer. Even though it isn't always the cleanest approach due to how messy the topology can get after using it, it's a pretty solid choice if you don't want to spend too much time working on LODs or create LODs which are supposed to be used at a distance where you can barely even see the object anymore. So let's clone this LOD3 as a copy, and then we'll simply rename it to LOD4, and we'll remove the numbers automatically added after boat. So first of all, let's see. We can go into edit mode and select the element selection mode, and we can get rid of some of the elements we have here, such as these planks you can see on the floor. Now we can add our Pro Optimizer modifier, just like in the previous tutorial. But before we hit on Calculate, it's extremely important that we click on Keep Textures and Keep UV Boundaries, so that the texture coordinates will not be all messed up as soon as we decrease the vertex percentage. So now we can actually decrease the vertex percentage to about... 77 I'd say. That's where things start to get a bit weird, so let's not push it too hard. We don't want any holes in our boat, and I would still much rather have it look somewhat like a boat from the distance. I would say this is good enough. For LOD5, if I really needed one, we could just remove even more parts, such as these three planks here, or the part there at the end, or maybe that metal tip. But this is already really good as it is. For production, for example, when we get this boat into Hunt Showdown, we'll probably only use the first three LODs anyway. So let's export this now, and let's begin with the CryTools exporting method. If I open the material editor, you can see that just like in the previous tutorial, I have my mesh submaterials here, which are applied identically to both the original mesh and all the LODs, and then I have my proxy submaterial, which has been configured according to our setup in the previous tutorial. So let's click on the utilities panel, and then the cryogen exporter button, and we're going to select our parent mesh, and then we'll add it to our exporting list. Now, I would like to take a moment to briefly explain what role these export settings play, and how you can use them to your advantage. So first off we have export file per node. Ticking this option will ensure that the exporter will export one separate CGF file for every single parent that you add to this export list. So for example, if I were to have three different boat setups, all with their own proxies and LODs parented to their own boat elements, then I could add three boat variations to this list, and as soon as I click export, it will export three different variations of the boat at the same time. It's a pretty self-explanatory function. Merge all nodes does pretty much the opposite, and should only be used when you have one single object that you want to export, and when the object is made out of multiple separated parts that you would want to merge together. For example, let's say I have a sword, which is made out of two main parts, the blade and the handle, each with their own proxies and LODs. If I want to export this as one object, I could add the handle and the blade parents to the export list, and if I toggle this option, the geometry of both the blade and the handle will become one single asset, therefore reducing draw calls. Now the cool thing about this is, the proxies and the LODs which I have created for the blade and the handle separately will also be merged into one asset. The custom normals option is pretty simple. If your asset has custom tangent space normals set up, this option will make sure that the information regarding the orientation of those custom normals will be exported as well. We'll talk more about this option in more detail in a future video. And the last one we're going to talk about for now is the 32-bit precision setting, which is useful when working with large objects which contain vertices that are far away from the center of the canvas. It basically increases the accuracy of a vertex's location in space by increasing the floating point precision that the 32-bit system allows. You only need to enable this option for really detailed assets that extend over a large distance from the center of the canvas, or maybe for character rigs, whose faces are generally pretty far away from the center of the canvas and you want the maximum possible vertex point precision in order to allow facial animations to have the highest possible detail and to avoid any kind of unwanted surface deformations. And that's all we're going to talk about for now. We'll cover the other settings in a future tutorial in the series, when we're going to talk about animations as well. For now, let's focus on exporting the boat and the LODs to the editor. First, I'm going to save the max file in the location where I want to export the object as well, just like in the previous video. So I'll save this directly in my objects folder, where I'll create a new folder for this boat alone. Now, just like we did in the last episode, we're just going to scroll down in this cry exporter list, and we'll create a new cryengine material, based on the material setup that we have in here. You can save that material wherever you want, but I'll save it in the same folder as the object I'm exporting. We can now scroll up and click on Export Nodes, and we're done. We'll continue the rest of the setup in CryEngine, but first I'll go over the FBX pipeline as well. The FBX pipeline itself is extremely simple when it comes to handling LODs. The same rules from the previous episode in the series still apply, meaning that you'll need to set up two different materials for your main mesh and for your proxy in order to physicalize them properly later on. 
The LODs you create, however, don't need a separate material. They'll use exactly the same material as your LOD0, or your parent geometry. All you need to make sure is that you number them properly. Same as before, the dollar sign rule still applies. Your LOD0 will be your parent mesh, which doesn't need to use any symbols, and then you'll have your dollar sign LOD1, dollar sign LOD2, and so on. As long as you respect the hierarchy, naming scheme, and the material setup, you're good to go. You can export the object as an FBX file, and as soon as you'll drag it in the FBX importer in CryEngine, you can see that the LODs have already automatically chosen the right options, and all you need to do is to configure the proxy just like the last time. Then you can generate the material and save the asset where you want it to be saved. So here I have the asset I exported just earlier. The information I'm going to present now applies to both the FBX pipeline and the CryTools pipeline, and the only difference in pipelines would be the importing method. As you can see, I've already dragged my finished asset into the scene, and all the textures have been assigned to the material accordingly. Now comes the time to check if the LODs actually work properly. So the best way to debug this would be to select the object, and to look over to the properties of the static object. Here you can see this LOD ratio slider, and if we drag this all the way up, we will decrease the distance we will need to have from the object in order to shuffle through all the LODs quickly. And if I move away from it, you can already notice the quality of the geometry decreasing as we go. However, there's a CVAR that can help with that. If we go into the console and type E underscore debug draw 3, you can see that we'll be able to see which LOD we're seeing at the current moment in time, and if I get closer or further away from the object, you can see that the number is changing. Adjusting the LOD ratio will change the distance ratio between the different LODs. And that's pretty much it, now you know how to set up your LODs using 3ds Max. If you have any questions or you need help, make sure to check out our official Discord channel, where you can easily get in contact with us and other members of our community. I'll see you there.